Excellencies, distinguished delegates, panelists, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Wherever you are connecting from, welcome to this year's annual General Assembly of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development, or the AGA, as we call it. I really hope you and your dear ones are all doing well and healthy. This is Maurizio Navarra. I am the acting coordinator of the Secretariat of the Platform, and I'm delighted to be your host today. Now, this year's AGA is very special. We are in the midst of a global health and social crisis, as you all know, and that is why we are holding our events this week virtually for the first time in the history of the donor platform. But this year is also very important because many of us are involved in the preparations for the Food System Summit, which will take place next year in New York. That is why for this year's AGA, we have chosen to focus on the theme of strengthening coordination towards SDG2 pathways for food systems transformation. Now, the AGA this year will open a discussion on what processes are needed at local, national, regional, and global levels to underpin food systems transformation. And specifically, it will focus on the role that donors and the donors community can play in catalyzing and supporting such processes. The outcomes of this annual General Assembly will be taken forward to develop a preparatory contribution of the platform for the Ford System Summit. The contribution will assess the way donors currently support and invest in food systems, and it will identify options for strengthening or changing this in the context of the wider agenda for food systems transformation. Now, this year we have organized four important sessions for you, and let me give you a brief outline of what the AGA will look like this week. You have all received the concept note and program of the four events and can obviously check the donor platform webpage for more information. Today is the high level event, which will be dedicated to transforming food systems, implications for coordination and financing. Tomorrow, we will deep dive into the main issues emerging today, and we will start developing a few elements of the platform's position for the Food Systems Summit. On Wednesday, we will have a dedicated session focusing on data for evidence-based policy making. And we will, in this regard, review two key initiatives that you all know that use data smart agriculture to support decision making. The session has been organized by the International Institute for Sustainable Development, Data for SDGs and the Gates Foundation. On Thursday, for our final session, we will focus on catalyzing responsible private sector investments for food system transformation. We will discuss how public goods donor support can help mobilize responsible private sector investments for food systems. Now, before we start, let me quickly remind you a few rules to keep this meeting efficient and safe. Some housekeeping. Please ensure that your audio is well set up. Use individual headsets to allow for better audio and please limit ambient noise. To improve today's communication with the speakers, you have all been muted by default. Now, should you wish to intervene during the Q&A session, please raise your blue virtual hand on the right-hand side of the screen that you must know already now, and we will open your audio channel. Alternatively, you can use the chat box to post your questions. When speaking, Please talk directly into the microphone without turning your head away and also ensure your camera is turned on. Remember, every time you take the floor to tell us who you are and where you work. After you have spoken, please ensure that the microphone is muted. We would also like to remind you to turn off all sound notifications on your computer and phone, for instance, Skype, WhatsApp or email when attending this meeting and speaking. And please feel free to share the link of our live stream today that is available on the donor platform website, www.donorplatform.org. We will also have social media reporting. So please, if you use social media, you are most welcome to spread the word using the hashtag DonorsAGA2020. You, you can see the hashtag in the email reminder we shared with you a couple of hours ago, which we are going to type also in the chat box during the conversation. Remember again that if you wish to speak, you can either raise your virtual hand or ask your question in the chat box or even in the YouTube live stream. Our team will assist 
during the session and bring your questions to the moderator. Now, let us start and focus on today's high-level session. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers today and a great moderator. You will find all the short biographies for all the speakers online on the donor platform website. Before we proceed to our high-level panel, let me introduce you to the speakers who will open the session today. Our first speaker is Paul van der Lot. Paul is the head of food and nutrition security at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He is also the donor platform co-chair. Paul, we are delighted to have you with us today. You have the floor, please, Paul. Thank you, Maurizio, and welcome to you all. Um, I think taking on a position like a co-chair um, like is a big responsibility for a platform like this in times like these. Um, and I think like one of the uh, rewards is like being in a lineup like this. Like I really showed showed this to my to my girlfriend, saying like, "Look, look at me. I'm in I'm in uh, the lineup with with uh, Agnes and Michelle Nunn and uh, Marie Haga." So thank you for that. Um, but it's also um, the discussion that we're going to have today that I believe is is very uh, is very necessary uh, and educational. Uh, a donor platform like this um, is is what is very much needed. I believe that uh, we've not been organized enough um, on SEG two, and there's been a lot of initiatives. But I feel that we can do better in getting these initiatives off the ground. And I'm, I'm really grateful for the work that Agnes and her team are doing in mobilizing as many uh, networks as possible in the run up to the, uh, to the Food Systems Summit next year. And I feel that we can really uh, play a role with knowledge sharing, advocacy and networking in promoting uh, those uh, uh, collaboration alliances to, to actually get to something. Um, the Food Systems, approach is not just another uh, approach. It's really a, a, a transition and a transformation in thinking of like how we can feed the world. Um, that system then can be supported with data, uh, but it needs to, uh, in the end, be translated to, uh, to trade-offs and, and synergies. And that's, I think, where the donors uh, really come in. I mean, apart from sort of supporting the work that, that is being done in getting to the system approach, like we need to, to really find sort of the, the, the spots where to push and then push together. Um, so I hope that today is a first uh, uh, discussion on like where these points might be and where the donor platform can play a role. Um, so I think I'll, I'll like in the discussion, like when, when that's not getting to the table, I'll put it in the chat box, but I really hope that at the end of this, um, we'll have some first ideas and especially at the end of this week, uh, we'll have some concrete um, uh, ideas of where uh, we fit in. Um, uh, so I wish you all a very fruitful uh, discussion and I thank you for participating. And I hope that uh, your uh, participation in the, in the platform is one that will, especially in this year, uh, be very frequent so that we'll see a lot of each other and can support each other's initiatives. Thank you very much and have a good meeting. Thanks very much, Paul, uh, for your remarks. Now we are very honored and privileged to welcome our second speaker, Dr. Agnes Kalibata, the United Nations Secretary General's Special Envoy on the Food System Summit. Welcome to this year's AGA, Dr. Kalibata. The floor is yours for the opening remark. Over to you. Thank you, moderator, and thank you all for inviting me. It's, uh, it's been some time. I talked to you at the beginning of, of the year. I met you at the beginning of the year. This was basically my first engagement as special envoy when you invited me to the uh, donor platform that happened in Berlin uh, on Zero Hunger. So I'm excited to be back. Since, a lot has happened since, of course, COVID happened. But we've, met, we've also made significant progress as we prepare for the Food System Summit. I want to, to say that I really appreciate the statement that is here that uh, in, in, the, in the document you sent, which says that the problem of current food systems are well understood. And there are so many potential solutions. What is not clear is pathways that can lead to systemic change. And I wanted to speak a little bit to that 
and what we are doing from a food systems perspective. What is also not clear, just to highlight a few other things that I feel are not clear, what is also not, not uh, clear and, and we must work for and we are trying to work for in the summit is that we all have the right level of consensus around what needs to change. So this summit is going to be really about three things, about building consensus around what needs to change and the level of, uh, uh, of need that we, we are sitting amid this when it comes to the food systems, uh, our food systems and what has to change. Um, the level of dialogue that we need to take to people and the level of um, uh, action that we need to mobilize. So in a nutshell, this summit needs to be about building consensus, taking it to people and coming up with ambitious solutions that will help us find a new path forward. So my job really has been about putting in place instruments of the summit that will help us achieve all three things. One of the instruments that we started with from the very beginning was the, the scientific group, which needs to work on the science of the summit and ensure that the summit is very clear around where we are coming from, but is also very clear around where we are going, the trade-offs that we need to look at as we move forward and the direction we must take. The second is action tracks, and I should say that Michelle Nan is one of the people that I will be speaking. Michelle Nan is one of the action track leaders, and we put in place action tracks recognizing that to move our food systems forward, we are going to have to come up with innovations, uh, game-changing ideas, but also recognizing that we, we have a few among us that we are already working with that need to go to scale. So in addition to that then, we have what we call uh, national dialogues. National dialogues is the place where we take the conversation to people. So for this food system to be about consensus, to be about ownership at all levels of society, we need to engage people at all levels of society. So we will have dialogues happening across all countries. We will ensure that those dialogues are focused on on a number of things. One, that each country is looking at its peculiar challenges and opportunities at country level, recognizing fully well that food systems are very peculiar to every country and every region of the world. And that solutions that are being designed are anchored in the, in the opportunities and challenges of those countries. Two, that food systems are inclusive of all peoples, indigenous peoples in these countries, and their diets and the, the cultures that surround their food, the smallholders and family farmers in these countries, uh, private sector in these countries, and the need to engage them and ensure that the solutions that we come up with are going to be anchored in solutions that countries themselves want to take forward. We will ensure that there are all ways of communication, including uh, in addition to dialogues, we'll ensure that there, there's a digital platform that allows people outside uh, those traditional groups that I've talked about of engaging, outside those groups, uh, there are civil society groups out there that are looking to engage differently. There are communities out there that would, might require to engage differently. There are young people out there that must be engaged. And we've created a platform that will allow for online dialogues, that will allow for all sorts of conversation to take place so that we do have a sense of what's happening out there, but also we give people an opportunity to participate in these conversations so that when we do arrive at a consensus and a way forward, that it is owned at all levels of society. So in terms of uh, what we expect the summit to provide at the end, we hope that the summit can come up with very clear uh, outcomes around the, the political discourse that we need to take as we go forward, what type of policies and policy frameworks will we designed to ensure that we, the food systems of the future that we are designing or we are transitioning to is something that we can implement, that it is anchored in good regulatory environment that can be implemented. Just as, as Paul and, and, and others would know, that we are beginning to see some of those, for example, in the farm to fork uh, um, work that is being done by EU with very clear guidelines around how to move forward on a number of these things but also that there's clear funding mechanisms. I'm talk, talking to you, this is extremely critical because for example, uh, coming through on SDG2, coming through on poverty and a number of SDGs on malnutrition and nutrition is going to require a lot of financing, a lot of new ways of thinking about financing. 
And um, as you would have seen from the series report that came out two weeks ago and, and the work that was mobilized by the German government on zero hunger, we are off track so badly and, and uh, probably COVID has made it so much worse that it, we are going to have to come up with new ways of thinking around how we overcome this problem. Now, that said, the most important part of, of coming through on this summit is going to be how we define action at country level, whether it's political action, whether it's investment action and funding action, whether it is all sorts of community action, but we must be able to define action that will really change the, tra the trajectory of things and where we are going. So I want to end on a note of uh, one of the, the things that, that I think would be important for this meeting. We've launched dialogues. We need these dialogues to happen at country level. We need people to participate. All, uh, all parts of the world, we need people to engage. But we are not seeing as much engagement as we'd like to see. For example, just to give you an example, we, set out, we sent out a call, uh, a call of, uh, to, of expression of interest to all countries to, to, high, to show us which action track they would be interested in joining we still have to get feedback from the G77 around which action tracks they would like to engage in. So country level engagement is going to be very cr critical. Countries are so tired of summits and conversations around what solutions could be that many countries are not participating. Yet this is so critical. Changing our food system is so critical. It's not one of those things that just become a debate. So the lack of engagement of countries is one thing that I want to highlight here that might, uh, that would be a challenge if we went forward with a few countries that understand what is critical without bringing along the, the many countries that we need to be part of the solution to this problem. Then even at country level, um, we need those, these dialogues to be real. We need to make sure that, um, that communities are participating, that different groups are participating, that different groups feel like their voices are being heard. I was uh, very, very uh, glad to hear today morning, I was in a, in a, in a meeting in the morning where Ireland announced um, uh, financing to the food system summit that would ensure that, uh, that these dialogues happen. Uh, similar funding would be, a, would be huge uh, to the summit to ensure that we don't just move along, we will take along with us people that understand what needs to be done, but we also take all stakeholders all people that need to be part of this conversation to ensure that we come through. So as we go forward, uh, the, the donor community is going to be very critical in not just funding the summit and ensuring that the summit comes through, but also ensuring that the conversation around the summit is the right level of engagement and the right level of conversation. This summit will not be real or complete or we won't find tangible solutions if we don't engage private sector. Most of our food systems as um, probably 70 to 90% run by private sector. We need the engagement. We need to make sure that private sector understands what's at stake and we need to ensure that they engage. We need to ensure that we invest in what it will take for private sector to be part of the solution to the problems we are trying to solve. We need to ensure that communities around the world are engaged as well as I have said earlier. So uh, by way of concluding this, um, I'm, I'm going to say that um, we need you to engage as the donor community right now to help us ensure that we come through the right way on the food system summit. We need everybody to engage. We need different communities to engage. We need to ensure that when we finish this summit, people are not saying, ah, that was just another summit, that there are actually clear solutions and pathways to take forward. We have put in place instruments to ensure that this summit will come through for everybody. But to be able to do that, this summit has to be uh, fully funded. This summit has to, to provide opportunities for people to engage. So I will say that there, right there is a huge responsibility for you all. As we go past the summit <clears throat> and we look at coming through on SDGs uh, in the next uh, 10 years, of course, there's a huge role for you to play. There's a huge responsibility for you all to come through on. And, and again, bringing private sector on board, bringing countries on board, ensuring we have the right frameworks by these countries, but also ensuring that when they put these things in place, they get the right level of funding that they need to move forward. is going to be very critical. This is, summit is a win-win situation. It's not going to be a place where you put resources in just for doing good. This is for all of us. 
This is for all of us. And so I really would like to encourage you to look to support us to ensure we come through on the summit, but also to, to work with us all to ensure that we find the right solution for this summit. There's no single country, no single region, no single people that, that no, no groups of people that are going to see the summit through without all of us working together. So I thank you for inviting me and I look forward to the discussions. And I really, really thank you for putting uh, ahead of us these three, four days of discussing what it might look like to work on a future food system summit and the type of solutions we might bring to this table. Thank you so much, moderator. And thank you all again for inviting me. Thanks to you, uh, Dr. Kalibata, for your inspiring words and uh, this uh, strong call for engagement and action. Of course, we will all be following very closely the food system summits, as well as the events and initiatives that are being organized leading up to the main event. And now we have two special messages. Because of conflicting schedules, the two speakers that will follow could not join us today, but they have recorded two very important video messages for you. Let me start with Michelle Nunn, President and CEO of CARE USA, who is leading action track four of the Four Systems Summit on equitable livelihoods. As you all know, CARE is one of the world's leading humanitarian organizations specialized in fighting global poverty and providing life-saving assistance in emergency. Let us watch the recorded message. Thank you, Jim. To the excellencies, distinguished delegates, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege and an honor to join this year's General Assembly of the Global Donor Platform and to lead Action Track 4, Equitable Livelihoods. When Agnes invited me to chair an action track, I immediately agreed because for CARE, our work to relieve hunger began 75 years ago with the CARE package and it continues to be the cornerstone of our mission. I also knew the profound importance this work would bring across public, private, and voluntary sectors to accelerate progress towards the achievements of the Sustainable Development Goals. It is great and it's an honor to have the support from Vice Chair Dr. Shakuntula Tilstead from World Fish and our Youth Vice Chair, Ms. Mai Tin Yuman from the UN Global Indigenous Youth Caucus, as well as our UN anchor organization, IFAD. As we work together to achieve our collective vision of a world where food systems are inclusive, sustainable, and healthy, the Equitable Livelihood Action Track will be specifically focused on ensuring food system development leads to creating jobs to eliminate poverty, raising incomes across food value chains, reducing risks for the poorest and the most vulnerable, and increasing value distribution. Our work will examine the impact this has on production, on consumption patterns, on people's nutrition, and on livelihoods. If we are to deliver equity in food systems, we must first look at those who are the poorest and the most vulnerable, such as small scale food producers, fishers, all the way through agricultural wage workers, and as those engaged in micro and medium enterprises along food value chains. Partnering with the research community will help ensure our approaches are grounded in science and sound evidence. We'll need to work closely to gain the support of governments to make certain policies, investments, and incentives are in place for their citizens to feed themselves with dignity. At the forefront of our work will be the equality of women. Understanding the experience of women smallholder farmers, the reality of the inequalities they face, and the solutions to empower them, especially during this pandemic. Women are just one of the vulnerable groups whose livelihoods are impacted by inequity in food systems. Youth and indigenous peoples also face significant barriers to equitable livelihoods across the food value chain, and we'll need to be vigilant to ensure their inclusion in these dialogues. As we work towards next year's UN Food System Summit, we will build solutions to tackle these roadblocks together and foster the partnerships necessary to overcome them. On behalf of CARE, I am so proud to lead this work and understand the importance of a very participatory and transparent process. This is a first step in that direction. And we invite you to join us as we transform our food systems and set a course for real change for the benefit of all people.
And finally, after we heard from Michelle Nunn, let me also introduce the next video message by Marie Haga, Associate Vice President of the External Relations and Governance Department at IFED. Marie heads a department at IFED that is responsible for communications, global engagement, partnerships, and resource mobilization, and relation with IFAD member states. As such, she is also leading IFAD's efforts in the Food Systems Summit and heads the department where the donor platform secretariat is hosted. Let us watch the video. Give me one second. Greetings to all participants. I am delighted to share a message on the occasion of the high-level session of the 2020 Annual General Assembly of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. I really appreciate the attention that the Donor Platform is giving to the theme of food systems. In view of the coming Food Systems Summit, which will take place, as all of you know, next year in New York. We are at a crucial moment in developing a global food and nutrition agenda and fully understand how it contributes to implementation of the SDGs. Now is the time to start moving from the what to the how, from what we already know to what we are going to take action on. The donor community has a vital catalytic role to play in helping understand the pathways to transform food systems, for example, through supporting innovation and new ideas, helping different actors coordinate, creating conditions for responsible private sector investments, contributing to government programs and reducing risk. I name only a few, there are many more. Having said this, we need to recognize that the total financial contribution of donors to the food and nutrition agenda is actually limited compared to investments by farmers themselves, national governments and the private sector. So, in responding to the outcomes of the Food Systems Summit, we need to be very sharp, sharp about how donor investments can have the biggest benefit and the most catalytic effect. I work at IFAD an institution that is currently engaging its member states in consultations for its 12th replenishment, or IFAD 12 as we call it. We hear and understand how traditional donor countries are struggling with budgets due to COVID. But honestly, even before COVID-19, we were seeing how many of the sustainable development goals were out of reach, in particular number one and two, on eliminating poverty and achieving zero hunger. As of today, almost 700 million people are hungry, three quarters of whom live in rural areas. People living in rural areas also make up 80% of those in extreme poverty. Based on the most recent scenarios, COVID-19 could push an additional 70 to 100 million people into extreme poverty just this year. It is awfully important to remind ourselves that many of these poor people are not only dependent on agriculture for their livelihoods, but they also contribute substantially to global food production. IFAD is the only global development institution that focuses exclusively on transforming rural economies and food systems. This is why we are absolutely delighted to be the UN anchor agency for the Food System Summit's action track on livelihoods and why it is our goal uh, to double our impact over the next 10 years. Ending extreme poverty and hunger in re and recovering from COVID-19 require more investment and innovative approaches. With the right policy and funding, we can tackle this as a global community. Although September 
2021 is in many ways just around the corner, we are still in the early stages of preparing for the Food Systems Summit. Your discussions this week are an opportunity for dialogue around ideas, issues and challenges that can be raised during the summit next year, and it will feed into the donor platform's contribution. This will help focus the catalytic and coordination role of donors in putting us all on the right path. IFAD is very pleased to now be hosting the Secretariat of the Global Donor Platform. This week's annual General Assembly is an excellent example of the convening and dialogue the platform can support. We are very much looking forward to continuing to support the platform's work in the lead up to the Food Systems Summit and, more importantly, in the critical work that must follow afterwards, in particular in rural areas. I wish you the best for this week and I hope you enjoy your fantastic lineup of contributors. I look forward to working together with all of you in the time ahead. Thank you. And these were our last opening remarks for today, uh, colleagues. Let me now move to our distinguished panel and leave the floor to Jim Woodhill, who is the director of AgriFood Nexus Consulting and honorary research associate in the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford. Jim is also supporting the platform in developing its new strategic plan for the next five years, 2021-2025. I wish you all a great event, and Jim, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you, Maurizio. And uh, thank you to our opening speakers for setting a great context for the panel discussion. Let me just check that I'm coming through OK, Maurizio. Yeah, this is perfect, uh, Jim. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and of course, a very big welcome to our audience. I see many friends and colleagues online. It's a shame we're not all in one big room and able to have a bit of a chat over coffee, but uh, I guess this is the next best thing we can do through this, through this virtual medium. Uh, let me first introduce our very distinguished panel today, and uh, we thank you so much for joining us. In the order of the opening remarks I'll ask them to make, let me introduce first Dr. Harmony Diop, who is Head of Natural Resources Governance, Food Security and Nutrition within the new partnership for Africa's development agency, NEPAD. He's representing today, Dr. Ibrahim Miyaki, the CEO of NEPAD, who unfortunately was called away at the last moment to deal with an emergency. We also have with us Carla Montesi, who is Director of Planet and Prosperity in the Directorate General of International Cooperation and Development of the European Commission. She's a lawyer with vast experience of European policy. Hanika Faber is joining us from Unilever, where she is president of Foods and Refreshment, and she's worked in senior roles across a range of leading companies in the food sector. Johan Valadou is with us as head of the Human Development Department in the French Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs. He has wide foreign affairs experience, including on health and food security. Dr. Johan Swinnen, who is Director General of the International Food Policy Research Institute, is also with us, and he's held academic roles and served as lead economist at the World Bank. And our final participant, but not least, is uh, Martin von Yuko, the Global Director of Agriculture and Food Global Practice at the World Bank. He brings to this discussion today nearly 30 years of experience of work in the World Bank on lending in agriculture. So the discussion we would like to have with our panelists is how to bring about the transformation that the UN Secretary General has called for in announcing the Food Systems Summit and what this means for making best use of funding by the global donor community. As, as Agnes um, started off with and as our other speakers have followed up with, the problems our current food systems are pretty well understood, as are many of the possible solutions. But how do we get on this pathway for change? How do we go from the what to the how, as, as Maria asked us to think about? 
So to kick off, what I'd like to do is to ask uh, each or one of our five panelists to each give us a perspective on the changes they would like to see by 2022. That's a year after the Food Systems Summit. And each panelist has been asked to focus on one of the five action tracks of the Food Systems Summit. Following this, we'll move into a discussion and a question and A with the audience, and then come back to some of the implications for investment in the, by the donor community. I've got a 13 year old daughter who's a very keen uh, football player. So I have here my uh, yellow and uh, red cards. And uh, if I need to nudge us, uh, our panelists along a bit, I'll hold up first a, a yellow card to say it's time to think about wrapping up and a, and a red one when it is time to, to wrap up. So with that, uh, Dr. Dia, Hamidi, let me come to you first. Billions of people depend on food systems to earn their income. And many of these people, as we've already heard this afternoon, are the poorest people on the planet. What three key changes are needed by 2022 to help put food systems on a pathway towards advancing equitable livelihoods? Over to uh, you. Thank you, thank you, Jim, and thank you, colleagues, uh, for uh, giving uh, NEPA the opportunity to have a voice in this conversation. Uh, and also, uh, please accept my uh, the apologies from Dr. Mike, who couldn't be who couldn't be here. So uh, let me just uh, see whether I can uh, contribute. Uh, looking at the African perspective, uh, from the African side, uh, we we have been looking at uh, food systems and uh, through the lens of the CADEP, uh, which is our continental platform. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, what we have noticed uh, at the moment is that uh, when you go into different countries, uh, you have uh, uh, too many policies, too many strategies, too many plans, too many programs. Often these are not aligned. Sometimes they are even in conflict. And in some cases, even member states ask us to come to help them to prioritize among those uh, different uh, uh, documents that they have. So the issue of coordination uh, to us is very, very important. Uh, so to have a good co co coordination in terms of moving forward, uh, I think we need to have like a, maybe seven, seven principles. One would be uh, you need to coordinate within a, within a lens of multi-sectorial uh, approaches. Uh, you need to have a clear uh, definition of the responsibilities of the different stakeholders that are engaged in, uh, in the whole process. Uh, as you indicated clearly, and, that, uh, uh, and also as it has been indicated by Dr. Kalibata, uh, we need to be results oriented in terms of coordination. You don't just coordinate for the sake of coordinating, but you need to have at the beginning of, uh, of the mechanism, uh, the clear goals uh, of the coordination that have been uh, identified. Uh, many often times people who are uh, in, in our continent list, uh, you have a lot of smallholders, farmers who contribute significantly to, to, to the food production, uh, but sometimes the, they lack the capacity even to be a, uh, to play a full role into those coordination mechanisms. Uh, then you have also uh, the intervention, the support that you, uh, like that the AGA uh, could provide, meaning the donor uh, intervention at the country level sometimes also creates some challenges. So you need also to align their intervention uh, so that they can be focused. Uh, and also one of the, uh, the seven principles that I wanted to, to put in place is the one that has been uh, addressed by Dr. Haga, which is the uh, involvement of the private sector uh, into, into this whole discussion. So these are the principles that uh, we would like to see in terms of moving forward. Now, uh, in terms of all the solutions that we would like to see, uh, into making a good food systems. Uh, I think there, there are three, three messages I would like to, to share. One, uh, we need to have a better, uh, to make a case for a good coordination and participation of smallholder farmers, at least in the African con uh, context. Two, we need to, to document the good practices uh, so that they can be also shared, uh, contextualized, uh, and then they will help basically the for, for smallholder farmers to learn from, uh, from each other or from region to region. Three, uh, we need to uh, facilitate uh, maybe a self-diagnosis uh, at the national level uh, or at the regional level uh, so that people can develop strategy 
that are uh, context specific. So let me end uh, stop here for now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you. You sensed it coming. <laughs> you still I have a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Is that 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 that's the end of your input? Fa fabulous! Thank you. Yes, that that that's the end of my contribution at this stage. Thank you. Thank thank, thank you very much, uh, Hamid, and a, and a great place to to start. And I think again, really important, reminding us about the importance of small scale farming in these issues, but how we get wider stakeholders cooperating, and I guess the the need, I guess, at a national and even a local level, to get a bit sharper about what the problems actually mean in practice at those at those scales. So. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much for that, um, Carla. Let me let me turn to you. And uh, as has already been mentioned this morning, we have still about 800 million people going hungry. We're heading in the direction of two billion people with uh, micronutrient deficiencies, and a vast number of people becoming overweight or obese. Obese. So we've got some huge challenges around our, our nutrition. What are three changes that you see are really needed by 2022? to help put food systems on a pathway towards ensuring safe and nutritious food for all. Carla, over to you. Many thanks, many thanks, Jim, and happy to join to the AGA. Let me congratulate really you to, to be able to organize this general assembly under very difficult and uncertain circumstances. So very well done. Now, in answering uh, to your question, you know that the European Union is really fully engaged in, in moving to the, the food system. Um, it, that is absolutely not uh, a, uh, an easy task, but let, let, let me mention uh, maybe three, three points. Um, we need clearly to make uh, uh, food system sustainable in a true economic, social, environment sense. And in this respect, uh, I just want to mention uh, the European Union initiative in adopting what we have called the, the farm to fork strategy that can provide, of course, an inspiration, not just uh, inside Europe, but also around the globe. And in this strategy, we have clearly mentioned the pathway to shift to fair, healthy and environmentally friendly uh, food system. Now, when, when we look to this food system, it's clear that we want to move away from the traditional sector approach and the cities as really in an integrated manner from sources of food to human body covering multiple sector, multiple actors. And of course, it is imply a paradigm shift that uh, is essential and it, it's absolutely not easy to, to, to achieve. The second thing that I would like to mention briefly is that we need to step up investment in research and the innovation leading to sustainable practices. We have launched the initiative ourselves at the level of European Union, it's the DESIRA initiative, really with the objective to foster innovation in particular through climate relevant practices in sustainable agriculture, moving to agriculture, agroforestry, value chain, and always through a multi actor uh, partnership. I can uh, demonstrate some example later. And thirdly, of course, uh, uh, clearly attention to the most vulnerable um, people in food crisis with a triple action combining development, humanitarian and the peace effort to have the best. I think all of us are on the table. We are a partner of the global network against the food crisis. And I think it's very, very important to continue to work in this domain. I stop here and uh, very happy to, to come with um, later in the debate. Over to you. Lovely, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carla. And some, uh, I mean, very good points there. And I think over, overlapping with what Harmony said as well around the importance of sort of an integrated approach and also you picked up on, on his theme about the importance of, of, of learning from, expect, from uh, good practice, picking up experiences of what people are already doing. And I think all of us are often inspired by what fantastic work is going on out there, but how do we learn from that and how do we scale that up? So thank you for those, uh, for those inputs. Annika, now let me, let me turn to you. Um, the, the challenges of our food systems, be it related to environment, climate, 
health or inclusive economies is, is, of course, incredibly tied up with what we consume, what we choose to consume, and I guess what we're encouraged to consume. So uh, you know, in that sense, um, what are the three changes you'd like to see by 2022 to help put food systems on a pathway towards sustainable and, and healthy consumption patterns? And I guess partly what's the role you see for the private sector in that, given the importance of the private sector that's been mentioned by our uh, earlier speakers? Yeah, thanks so much, Jim. And, and thanks for having us here as a, as a representative of the private sector. We certainly feel a huge responsibility uh, at Unilever as a big foods company to contribute as much as we can to food systems transformation. And um, we just want to voice my support both for the summit and for EU Farm to Fork. Um, both are fantastic efforts and we look forward to supporting those as best we can. So three key changes. If I can only mention three, um, I'll focus on the ones that you know are most are, are, have most to do with consumers. Um, and they would be more plant-based eating, more nutritious options to eat, and reducing food waste. So let me just say a few things about all three. Um, you know, encouraging consumers to towards more plant-based diets is absolutely critical. Um, and the Eat Lancet report laid it out very well last year. You know, we should all be eating twice as much fruit and veg and half the meat that we're eating today, and that would do a whole bunch of good for both the planet and for the health of people. Um, so as, you know, as Unilever, we're really trying to do that. Um, we acquired a small company called the Vegetarian Butcher last year and we're um, expanding that brand around the world, alternative protein. But also simple things like delicious ice creams, you know, Ben & Jerry's. We now have a big dairy-free business on Ben & Jerry's. Again, to just reduce um, meat consumption and dairy consumption. So that's one. Um, second, more nutritious options, absolutely critical, and, and we know our responsibility in the area of reformulation. We must continue to reformulate for less sugar, less salt, and fewer calories. Um, but we also have a role to play for positive nutrition, so adding positive micronutrients to products that many, many people around the world consume. Um, for example, zinc, um, which we've just added to Horlicks. Um, basically, every child in India, or almost every child in India consumes really helps boost immunity. Same goes for vitamin C, iodine, and, uh, and iron in some of our bouillons and teas. So that's number two. And then third, reducing food waste. It is a crying shame that about a third of what we all produce together gets wasted. Um, and there, we first have to get our own ass in order. We waste too much as a company from factory to shelf. And so that's, that's a huge effort. But we also have a big role to play with consumers. So our Hellman's brand spends its entire marketing budget on a campaign called Make Taste, Not Waste, um, which you can actually do with mayonnaise, use all those leftovers. Um, and that's actually having really, really important results. Um, so those would be the three I would mention. Of course, there's many more like sustainable sourcing, less plastic, um, but there's no time for those today. Um, but rest assured, um, we are very intentional in working on all of those really hard. And fantastic. Thank you, Hanika. And I think we'll sort of come back to sort of push you a little bit harder what that means for actually changing what consumers consume as we go through our, through our discussion, but a, a great starting point. Thank you so much. Um, Johan, let me, uh, let me come to you. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm pronouncing your name correctly there with my Australian accent, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and I think the, the, the question to you sort of flows on a little bit from the sustainability side. Um, you know, we're currently consuming our natural resources on a completely unsustainable basis. So, you know, what are the changes we need to be really thinking about to put food systems on a, on a pathway towards being uh, more nature positive in, in the way we produce food? Over to you. Many thanks, Jim, and thank you so much for inviting us. So we are very pleased to be here and congratulations for the, the great organization. My name is Joan, so you were, you were not far at all from the, from the right French uh, pronunciation. Thank <laughs> you so much. Uh, there are three things I would like to highlight to, to answer this question about Action Track 3. First, I think one of the big changes that we need to bear in mind uh, in order to, 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 to be on the right pathway towards boosting nature positive uh, production is really the need to scale up agroecological transition in agriculture, uh, livestock farming and fisheries which is in our view really particularly relevant to improve health of the planet and of the people. With agroecological practices, 
uh, farmers can actually sustainably manage natural resources on the one hand without compromising yields. And at the same time, consumers, uh, at the other hand of the, at the other end of the value chain, they have access to, to healthy food. So for us, it's really a key point. It requires clearly implementing ambitious uh, agricultural policies with clear environmental targets, but also tools to support farmers reaching those targets, such as financial uh, incentives, such as organic agricultural inputs, uh, alternatives to veterinary, uh, veterinary antibiotics, for instance. And that's what France is trying to do. We support agroecological transitions in different parts of the world, especially through the, uh, the French Development Agency, which is uh, uh, organizing concrete actions on the ground on the, in that regard. And something I also would like to add on this is that France really want to build a momentum at the international level as well. And in, the, in that regard, agroecology will indeed be one of the main four teams at the next One Planet Summit, uh, which will be taking place in, in January 2021 hosted by President Macron. A second point I wanted to highlight really is the fact that in our view, there is a strong need to improve both in quantity and in quality, agricultural and rural training. There is clearly a need to revamp current contents of agricultural technical education in order to include learning on agroecological practices for farmers, of course, but also for extension advisors and other food systems actors. And the use in particular needs to be supported in our view. Young people can find interest in agroecological practices also because uh, contrary perhaps to some preconceived views, agroecology is precision agriculture that requires a fine knowledge of plants and soils as well as innovation. Third point I would like to, to emphasize really, um, forest is the lung of our planet. Hence, we need to stop deforestation. And this theme will also be on the agenda of the upcoming One Planet Summit. Uh, France is highly involved in ending deforestation and has adopted its national strategy against imported deforestation, which aims to end by 2030 deforestation caused by importing unsustainable forest and agricultural products through actions at all level of the value chain. And one final word, if you, if you allow me, uh, Jim, which will be twofold. First, to say oh, that please. <laughs> Go. <laughs> with just with a broader perspective on the Food System Summit, Uh, what I really would like to recall is the importance of the synergies between the different action tracks. We have to consider food systems as a whole. We need policies that can encourage farmers to produce sustainably, but also we need consumers willing to buy healthy food, which is action track two, and at an affordable and fair price, which is more like action track one and four. And my final word is really that the current pandemic is showing us that there is a strong interlinkage between food, biodiversity and human health, really stressing in our view, the relevance of the One Health approach. And that's something that we really want to strengthen. And on the occasion of the Paris Peace Forum next week, we will propose along with Germany, uh, initiative to strengthen the science policy interface and better connect human, animal and environmental health. Thank you so much, Tim. Lovely, thank you, thank you much, uh, Johan. And I think again, connecting back to some of the important points made by Harmony about uh, investing in capacity and an integrated approach. So uh, let me now move on to, to Johan. Welcome and uh, thank you so much for being with us this, af this afternoon. Um, I think we've all been sort of struggling a bit to come to terms with the consequences of COVID-19 and how that, you know, it was been quite a shock to food systems. But I think we're also incredibly aware of the sort of likely shocks to food systems from climate change, from potential future other sorts of disease outbreaks or, or natural disasters. So Could you give us a view on what you think are some of the changes needed to create a, a far more uh, resilient food system as we move into the future? Yeah, Jim, thanks very much for inviting me here and for giving me the floor. Uh, as you said, uh, COVID-19 has certainly brought the concept of resilience very much to the forefront in our thinking about food systems. Uh, but what is resilience? Okay, there's a lot of different definitions on that and quite a bit of discussions both in the academic arena and among uh, policymakers. I think I could use up my four minutes here just talking about what resilience really means, but I presume that's not what you, what you invited me for. So I think one way of thinking about it from a practical perspective or, is to think about different groups of measures. So one, and uh, so in order to make a food system more resilient, One thing is to limit the frequency and the magnitudes of the shocks to the system. It's kind of uh, pre uh, prevention, if you want. Uh, the second group is to anticipate the shocks that will come better, so be prepared. 
And the third one is to absorb more efficiently and more effectively the shocks when it uh, occurs. Now, a crucial point is for thinking about resilience is the role of inclusiveness. Okay, and I think inclusiveness really plays a very important role in, in thinking about resilience and in, in basically how resilient the system can be. They're really, this is a really fundamental point and it interacts with resilience in several ways. So let me briefly go identify a couple of points within these three groups in terms of limiting the shocks, frequency, magnitude. Clearly, climate change is an important factor going forward already now. And so anything we can do to limit that effect, I think is important also for resilience. Second one, uh, again, in terms of inclusiveness, I mean, a major reason for food shocks already also today in the world are really political and social conflicts. I mean, and that's uh, in the sense that inclusiveness uh, is basically preventing these shocks, these uh, <clears throat> conflicts to take place. That is important. In terms of anticipation, there are clearly digital technologies, a whole variety of new technologies that we can use are important and improving not just the fact that the technologies is there, but also access to the information for smallholders, for consumers, etc. So we need better information, better quality, but also access uh, for um, also the poor to that type of information. And in terms of absorption, I think there Financial instruments are really important, okay? In terms of the liquidity uh, during shocks, we've seen that now very much as important on the production side, meaning not just for the farmers, but also for the, everybody involved in the value chains. But it's also important in, on the consumption side for, I mean, a major problem right now with the COVID-19 effect is really effects on the demand side. And, um, and so in order to have social security programs, maybe social safety nets, which are conditional on these shocks, et cetera, introducing these, all of that is really important. The, um, and then in the longer term, this is not probably happen, affecting by 2020 or 2022, investment in rural infrastructure, investment in R&D to come up with better technology in the long run, accessible technology for small holes, et cetera, is really crucial. Thank you very much. Lovely. Um, thank, thank you very much there. And I mean, I think the, the challenge of really understanding what a more resilient food system is, is, is one of the big issues that people are going to have to get their heads around for the, uh, for the Food Systems Summit. Look, that was a, a, a fascinating sort of introductory perspective from all of our panellists and I think has illustrated what some of the enormous challenges we face. Uh, a, a huge range of the dimensions that we need to be thinking about, which certainly leads us into plenty of scope for the sort of issues that the Food System Summit will have to be, have to be tackling. Uh, Martin, let me, let, me, let me come to you, and I've been a bit mean here in giving you the sort of the, the next go at this and, and inviting you to, to wrap up a little bit what you've heard from our panelists so far, and perhaps to reflect on um, the things that really give you hope in, uh, in being able to move forward and bring about this change? And what do you see as some of the really big barriers that we still need to be thinking about and which we should come back to our panelists to explore in the next half hour or so? Martin, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jim. And I'm very pleased to be part of this um, panel as part of the annual General Assembly meeting. Um, and I've, of course, you asked me actually two questions, you know? I mean, it's the, what areas give me hope and what are the, uh, and what are the barriers? Uh, I think you know, when you listen to the... Uh, introductions and the, and the panelists, I mean, clearly food systems transformation is a massive agenda with massive uh, challenges. Uh, but what, so what gives us hope? You know, I think listening to everybody, I think there are kind of four areas that I see. Um, you know, I pick up what Agnes said. Agnes said, you know, COVID-19 has made things so much worse and we need to come up with new thing, new ways of thinking. Um, now to the extent, I mean, that, um, you know, that, that this was already a, a, a huge agenda prior to COVID-19 and people might be thinking that we, we can do food systems transformation to business as usual. I think that notion because of COVID-19 is no longer feasible. I think that realization is, is sinking in, you know, in many parties and stakeholders involved. And I think that's a good thing. Um, I think the second area of hope, I mean, that relates to what Carla said, I mean, uh, you know, the European Union making food systems more sustainable, but also make sure that we do that in an economically acceptable uh, way. Uh, I think there, I mean, the calculations that have been done, and there have been many, I mean, looking at uh, food systems transformation, um, the overall notion is actually uh, that there is actually an economic dividend, I mean, to be um, um, 
uh, captured if food systems transformation is done. I mean, the phone report, I mean, growing better that came out last year at the uh, climate change summit, I mean, actually put forward a number of about $5.7 trillion uh, by 2030. So it makes economic sense. I mean, there is a business case for it. Uh, so I think that's the second area of hope. Uh, the third, I think, relates to what um, um, was said earlier um, uh, by, uh, by Joe, by Johan. Um, you know, the digital technologies, uh, you know, I think this is huge potential there, digital technologies affecting many uh, different segments of value chains in a kind of simultaneous fashion. I mean, think of, um, you know, uh, precision farming, e-marketing platforms, early warning systems, you know, digital provision of government services, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then the fourth area, I think is related to what Samari of IFAT was saying. I mean, in the end, you know, it's the public sector and the private sector that need to make the, uh, the investments. And of course the donors, I mean, can provide catalytic uh, investments. I think there we see major movements because of COVID-19. Uh, I mean, public support, I mean, to agriculture provided by government is about $600 billion uh, per year. Um, what we see is because of the economic impacts of uh, COVID-19, a lot of fiscal stress uh, because of economic impacts. So ministers of finance and governments taking a hard look at all their expenditures, including public support to agriculture. And we see, you know, and I see it myself in governments coming forward who actually want to discuss this and how those resources can be actually be repurposed, I mean, for better outcomes and higher um, efficiency and effectiveness. Um, and um, with the private sector, I think that uh, was also said by, by Joe, um, uh, you know, to the extent that prior to COVID-19, uh, the private sector was, kind of optimizing, I mean, a, uh, optimizing the functioning of food supply chains based on the criteria of efficiency only. I mean, clearly the now there's a huge interest also to bring in resilience. And I think that also bodes well for the food systems uh, transformation agenda. So those are four areas of hope. Um, a number of areas, I mean, that I think uh, that uh, are barriers, I mean, that need to be overcome. I mean, um, I think there are also four there that I can mention. Uh, one is, um, vested interests, um, you know, change is not going to be easy. Um, and, um, you know, so overcoming the vested interest uh, and the political will, I think was also mentioned by some of the panelists uh, in the introductions uh, is going to be important. Our experience shows actually that uh, three ingredients that are important to deal with this. I mean, we need high level champions. We need the voice of the farmers in the debate and we need uh, evidence based analytics actually to kind of make sure that uh, policymakers actually have the, uh, the evidence and the information to make uh, smart choices when it comes to repurposing public support and, 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 and policies. Uh, I think a second area is, you know, food systems transformation is a holistic agenda, uh, brings together many different institutions. And um, so the fragmentation of the institutional framework, I think, is another major barrier. So, so how, how can we actually um, uh, deal with that. I have some ideas about it, but I saw a yellow card, so maybe I have an opportunity <laughs> later. Uh, the third barrier is, um, you know, there are no silver bullets. Um, so solutions in farmers' fields tend to come into packages. Um, so that also doesn't make it easy for farmers to uh, adopt those type of uh, uh, technology uh, changes and, and, and changes in practices because they come as a package. And then four, the fourth barrier, and I think Joe has mentioned it as well. I mean, that um, many countries, I mean, are facing conflict. Uh, and of course that makes the um, operating environment, I mean, for food systems transformation in many countries quite uh, difficult. Uh, we have some ideas on how to deal with that. We will be coming out at the bank with a new report on agriculture and FCV uh, um, uh, situations in the countries uh, that can provide actually some light on that. Uh, and I'm happy to kind of uh, provide some more details on it in the discussion. Back to you, Jim. Great, fabulous. Thanks, uh, Martijn. And that, again, is a, a very rich menu of things for us to think about and, and discuss for a, a little bit longer in our next, next hour. We uh, probably could spend the next two days rather than the next two hours on all of this, but uh, a, great, a great agenda. Um, let me just ask our audience that uh, we're now moving to a point where in a, a little while we'll start opening up for some uh, questions and um, uh, input to the panel from, from the audience side. So if you'd like to raise a question, you can type it into the uh, chat box or you can put up your hand and uh, we'll come to you and, and invite a question from you. 
Um, to kick to kick off getting some responses across the panel, Hanika, given I can see your video on, I could <laughs> maybe I could move back move back to you, and even and pick up on uh, one of the points that was just raised by Johan about tackling um, vested interests and getting the right political drive behind all of this. And I think what's been interesting in hearing the discussion from all of you is a lot of focus on how do we get the institutions right? How do we get the incentives right? How do we get people working together rather than perhaps technical solutions? So you know, how, do we, how do we get the politics and the vested interests right in bringing about the change? Oh, you're on mute, uh, Hanika. Apologies, one thing one would learn. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, you know, it was said earlier that we know the what and we now need to figure out the how. I, I think in this space, we even know the how. The how is public-private partnerships. Um, that's how we really move things forward. So if I look at some of the toughest things that were mentioned, you know, small holder, holder farmers and their livelihoods and their productivity, um, we've seen some great examples that we've been involved with as Unilever in terms of public-private partnerships to truly help those smallholders. So whether that's, you know, vanilla farming in Madagascar or black soybean farming in Indonesia or tea farming around the world, when we get together with universities, with governments, uh, with others in the private sectors and with donors like yourselves, um, we really make change happen. Um, I think one of the best example actually is the IDH um, Farm Fit Fund, which makes investing in smallholders attractive and takes some of that risk out. Again, you know, we're involved as, as well as USAID and the Dutch government who are here, but also Rabo Bank, uh, always in the bank, and a few other companies. So when we get can get together as pub public and private sector to scale some of the things that we know work and work for smallholders, um, you know, success is out there. So that's 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 why we're here today as well. You know, we, no one can do this alone. We've got to do this together. And I think looking forward, one of the things that we're excited about are the World Economic Forum's innovation hubs, um, which again are set up to get lots of stakeholders together on something that's already been piloted. And there's hubs now in, in Africa, in Latin America, and in India. Um, where there's some pilots that have worked now, how do we get multiple stakeholders together to scale it? Because we don't want to affect hundreds or thousands of smallholders, we want to affect millions. Um, so I think public-private partnerships is absolutely key. Focus on the ones where we already have some evidence that pilots have worked and go and scale them. Thank you, Hanika. Let me ask if uh, any of the panel members would like to to respond what they've heard from, from Hanika. Maybe you could put your hand up or just jump in and start speaking. Uh, Johan. Yeah, actually then, I wanna very much um, basically support what both Marta and, uh, and, and Hanika said in the sense that, you know, the new evidence is coming in is that there's been a massive amount of breakdowns in, in, in a number of supply chains early on, but there's a lot of, things which have happened in the restoration, if you want. It's not really restoration because they're organized in different ways now, but a lot of creativity uh, by small companies, large companies, by families, but also in the public sector, by producers' organizations, by consumers' organizations in the villages, etc., to basically reorganize the supply chains and the value chains and how they're working with their suppliers in, in various things. And so a lot of creativity is right now going in there Investments which companies had planned for the next 15 years, for example, in digital approaches have been front loaded, all taking place in a couple of months. And I think there's a lot of activity which is going on, which I think is also very hopeful. I mean, again, I do not want anyone to say there's no problems anymore. Clearly not. But I think that is important. And then on the other point, on the political side, for example, in India, the government has introduced a number of really far reach reaching uh, agricultural reform programs, which had been on the on the agenda for decades, but they hadn't been able to make it through. And now, with COVID, there has been political room for introducing these reforms, which may have very significant impact. And so, there also, I think the the room for making important changes at the policy front, I think, is also important. Thank you. Thank Thank you, Johan. And maybe if I could just follow up on that. I mean, you're you're basically telling a story here of 
humanity being able to respond when we're faced with a crisis. And I guess one of the problems we've had in the, in the food systems change is it's sort of a little bit too far off for us to respond today. So, so what can we do in trying to sort of bring the, the crisis response we've seen around COVID to help tackle what are perhaps longer term, longer term issues? Johan, can you? Uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure whether the question was from me. Oh, yeah, or no, I, was, I, was coming, I was coming back to you because you were giving this very, very nice sort of story about how in response to COVID, there's been an awful lot of um, innovation and, and quick reaction. So my question was, how do, we, how do we bring that quick reaction that we can see in the face of a crisis into issues that are perhaps sort of longer term and we're not going to feel the effect for 5, 10, 15 years or even a generation? Well, I think, first of all, the, the example I gave from India with the agricultural reform, that will have long lasting impacts for sure. Um, I think on the the investments which are going or the, the creativity, the changes, I mean, there, I think there's a whole new thinking in terms of it, both in terms of how the value chains or the food systems more broadly, because it's also, about, for example, school feeding programs, etc., uh, re rethinking okay of how they can be more resilient also i think the sustainability issues will come back in because people think about sustainability as an element i think of, of resilience etc and so in that way the aware the, martin um, he talked about awareness okay this is growing i think that's really important i think at all levels of of the food system thank you Thank uh, you, Jim, yeah. Jim, on, on your, on your okay, question. Let, let me come to you and then I'll come back to Harmony if that's okay. Okay. Yeah, no, go, uh, go ahead, Martin. Yeah, no, so I, I think what you said, you know, on the short term vis a vis the, lo the, the, the long term, you know, I mean, uh, you know, we, we feel very strongly in the bank, uh, and it was also confirmed at the annual meetings uh, that were just concluded. I mean, that you cannot actually really separate, I mean, uh, the two. If you look at increasing poverty, if you look at increasing hunger and food insecurity, I mean, the major uh, causes are what we call the three C's. No, it's, it's conflict, it's climate change, and it's COVID-19. I mean, those are the root causes. Uh, and at the same time, the food system itself is at the origin of those um, uh, root causes. I mean, um, compromised access to uh, water and, 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 and land and, and natural resources is an important source of uh, conflict. Um, we know, I mean, the, the, uh, the contribution of the agriculture and land use sector, I mean, to uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, 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 and climate change. And when it comes to COVID-19, we should not forget, I mean, uh, that, that COVID-19 is a pandemic of zoonotic nature. Uh, and of course, zoonotic risks are very much associated with uh, encroachments of natural habitats, of which agriculture is one of the biggest drivers as well as, I mean, the uh, poor functioning of, uh, of, of wet markets. So the food system itself, you know, is at the origin of the root causes of the problems that we see. And for that reason, the distinction between short-term response and longer-term response is, is a kind of irrelevant here. You know, you cannot respond without also uh, dealing with the root causes of what we see. Back to you, Jim. Thank, thank, thank you, Martin. Some really, really good points there for us. How many? Let me, let me come across to you. Uh, th thank you, Jim. I, uh, there is one question addressed to me in the chat box, and uh, but I wanted to react also to some of the issue on uh, the public private sector. So can I go ahead and uh, respond to both, or just should I focus on one item at the time? Please do do both. Uh, okay. So I think on uh, I would like to react to some of the uh, of what uh, Ms. Haneke, uh, uh, Mrs. Haneke said uh, on the public-private partnership. Uh, I would like just to highlight two examples. If you look at uh, the chocolate industry in, at the global level, it's $100 billion industry. You have uh, two countries that are supplying 70% of, of the raw material, which are Cote d'Ivoire and, uh, and Ghana. Uh, and yet the, those countries are cashing in 6.6% of basically their global value. And the reason is because most of the public, uh, most of the funding is, uh, is, is public funding, like it's a, it's a government like a, a push funding. Uh, you don't have like a, a, the smallholder farmers are not really very well integrated in the value chain. So they are not benefiting from it. You look at another example uh, in Ghana uh, there is a company called the Blue Sky Company. Uh, back in, uh, in the 1990s, like 1998, uh, it's a private sector company. 
that came to Ghana and decided to work with a lot of smallholder farmers uh, without going to the co-ops, just smallholder farmers, but they realized that for the smallholder farmers to take advantage of the value chain, they need to bring the production up to the international standard. So they basically uh, manage the process of uh, bringing all the production facilities, all, all, all the produce uh, to, the, to, the, to the international norm, basically to meet the uh, Europe GAP protocol for quality practices. And then they were able to expand the market and, and help those uh, smallholder farmers access to, uh, to the international value, I mean, to, to integrate well into the value chain. So here you have two examples where in one of them, you don't have a strong PPP in the other one, you have a very strong private sector engagement and you have different outcomes in terms of like uh, the benefit that the smallholder farmers are, are pulling out. So in my humble opinion, there is a way to find a middle ground where you can uh, have a very strong, uh, a very strong basically uh, smallholder, uh, I mean private sector engagement into the value chain, but also a lot of capacity, a lot of uh, bringing up to standard a lot of norming uh, to, to, to be able to meet the, the international uh, standards. So these are the two things I wanted to, 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 to put on the place. The other thing also is that in Africa, for example, uh, head of state have said for the continent to meet its need in terms of food security, country need to allocate 10% of the GDP uh, to, uh, uh, to agriculture. After 15, year, 15 years of implementation of uh, those commitments, uh, I mean, the results are very timid. You have few countries that have allocated, that are allocating 10% of their basically uh, public expenditure into, the, into agriculture. What this is telling us um, is that even if you put that in place, you need to put in place also a mechanism to monitor it, to make sure that countries are held up to, to the commitment they are making. Uh, so these are the, maybe some, some of the things that I wanted to, to add to uh, some of the comment made by Ms. Haneke. The second one, uh, someone has raised a question on uh, alignment between the different policies. Uh, in the continent, what we have been doing, at least in the African continent, which could be maybe an example that uh, other people can learn from, uh, is that we have basically the CADEP, which is the, our platform. Uh, and through the CADEP, we help countries to develop uh, what we call uh, uh, agriculture uh, strategic policies, and then we support the country to develop investment plan that are fully aligned to, 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 to those policies. And then we support them to, to mobilize resources and to do the implementation. Uh, after the 10 first years of implementation of CADEP, we, 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 we basically took, took a full stop, uh, try to learn from uh, what has happened and try to use that to, to inform uh, our different policies. The issue of multi-sectorality that I addressed earlier on in terms of coordination came from the fact that we have expanded basically the, the, the policy goals and objectives, and it has made it more complex. Uh, we're not just looking at food security, we're looking at resilience, we're looking at access to market, we're looking at uh, uh, nutrition, uh, we're looking at policy. So, so because uh, the, the goals have changed, we need also to bring different ministries and different uh, institutions uh, to, 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 to contribute to it. That's where the issue of, uh, of alignment uh, needs really to be strengthened. Uh, so these are the two contributions I wanted to make. Uh, over to you, Jim. Jim, I think you are muted. Thank you. And I was just about, oh, I think the whistling's gone, so it might have been somewhere else. Um, Thank you very much. And I mean, just following up on, on what you've just said, I'm wondering if I could turn to, to Carla and Johan from a policy perspective. I mean, what's needed to get policy in the right place to A, lead to the sort of alignment that uh, Harmony has been talking about and to get the sort of public-private cooperation that uh, Hanneke has uh, said is so, so important? Which one of you would like to jump in first? I, uh, I, Jimmy, I, I can jump 
in yeah. in because the the, the question it's uh, the question that uh, the point that Amadia has put and the Enrique and the, the question that is in the chat is really very very relevant because of course we are all engaged now to move to this transition to sustainable agri food system but let me say that as was just mentioned we don't just need to to, to move or to support the government in, in their reform of, of, of the food system, but also fully involved the private sector and the financial institutions. So it's, 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 it's very, very important. So, uh, for example, I, let me say that in our future international cooperation, our future portfolio for the next period, 2021-2027, we have, of course, foreseen funds in order to support the government uh, uh, in the process of uh, reform and uh, support the government with a uh, strong uh, dialogue to, to this reform of food the system on, on the food uh, on the food system on the process on the transitional process but we have also foreseen innovative financial instrument just to support private sector financial institutions to also intervene with clearly investment in the agri-food system um, um, with a clear investment. So we have foreseen new de-risking uh, financial support through what we call the guarantees in order to help private sector to intervene uh, in the food system process in order to ensure the, the coherence that was the policy coherence, coherence that was already mentioned. So not just support to the process, the transformation, the transformational process, so the reform, but also through creating the incentive for the private sector intervene also in investment um, in, with the objective of the agri-food system. Thank you. Over to you. Lovely. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Carla. And uh, that's a nice response to the question that Patina had uh, put in the, the chat box. And uh, let me do a little plug for our session on Thursday this week, which is explicitly talking about the role of the private sector. So we hope many of our audience will join us again for that session where we'll have a chance to go into these issues in, in some more detail. Um, Johan, let me come across to, to you. Uh, you. Uh, you and Valadu. <laughs> Sorry oh, for that. My Australian pronunciation of Johan and Johan right. <laughs> no problem. No, I think a, a lot of have already been said by all valuable speakers. So I'll be very short. But there are two things that I would like to to underline. Perhaps if you allow me. First is really uh, the need to to make sure that that we can support change. In our view, is to take into account the fact that food systems are localized and hence, I mean, a territorial. Uh, tailored approach, if I may say so, to rural development uh, is needed in order to improve the design and implementation of agricultural and food programs and policies. And in terms of actors, you know, this kind of approach, in our view, is also a, a good way to include all local actors, notably NGOs, um, to, who have a strong knowledge of the field to be on board. And that's why we try to do a, 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 in our own programs. And a final thing I would like to, to, to emphasize and to echo in that way, uh, I think the intervention of Michel Nunn at the beginning of the, of the panel is really the, the, the need to focus on, on women uh, collectively, whatever the private sector, public sector, NGOs. We need really to strengthen our support to women in agriculture, where uh, in our view, many factors still hinder uh, women's access to productive resources, to financial instruments and decision-making bodies. So, uh, and, and don't forget that the FAO considers that gender equality in access to farming resources would lead to reduce the number of people suffering from hunger by, by 150 million just by implementing women's rights. So I think it's also a very transversal important thing to bring. Thank, thank, thank you, uh, Johan. A really, really critical point to, to, to raise here. And there's a, you know, a lot of evidence that really backs up exactly what you're, you're saying. That would be an internal call uh, for a budget and oh, could, um, could somebody mute their mic if they've got something going on in the background. Um, Martijn, you uh, wanted to jump in here. Yes, thanks, uh, Jim. Now, on the private sector, I think there's an important point to make now. I mean, uh, I think it was the Wall Street Journal who came out, um, you know, not too long ago with a, with a new study on, you know, they, they, they surveyed 5,500 publicly traded companies, I mean, on their ES, ESG, um, you know, environment, social and governance um, uh, standards. Um, 
and actually only one food company made it in the top 100. Um, so, so, you know, when it comes to the food sector and the private sector uh, helping out on transformation, I mean, there really is a huge agenda uh, ahead of us in that sense. Thank you, Martina. And maybe that's a good point to come back to you, Hanneker. I mean, how much how much can the private sector do on their own and how much does it require government? Where's the balance? Where are the incentives going to come from to drive the change? Yeah, the private sector can do anything on their own, but I think, you know, forums like today are incredibly helpful. Please invite us in um, rather than seeing us as the big bad guys who um, don't want to collaborate don't care about food systems transformation. Um, certainly at Unilever, it's very clear to us that if we do not get to a fairer, healthier, more sustainable food system, we won't have a business. Um, so I saw the question in the chat, you know, what motivates us? Well, we want to have a business 10, 20, 50, 100 years from now. And if there's no planet because we've completely screwed it up, then that's the end of that. So the motivation is pretty clear. The second motivation is that all our consumers, the people who buy our products, want healthier and more sustainable products. So, and the world is becoming ever more transparent, so they know how we make our stuff and where it comes from. Um, so I, I think there's very few food companies who don't want to contribute uh, to sustainable food systems. So, you know, let's, let's pull them in, even though maybe less enlightened ones, and let's all work together because when we get these public-private partnerships to work, we get results. Right, thank, thank, thank you, Hanika. And I think this is a very good lead into Thursday's discussion. Perhaps if I could come back to you, Han uh, Swinnen, um, mm-hmm. make sure I've got this correct. Um, and could you reflect a little bit on what you're hearing from others around the importance of research and knowledge and where that balance needs to go from sort of a technical understanding of of how to bring about change to the social and the political change, how much more do we need to be investing in what sorts of research and and knowledge generation, sharing best practices, and and how could that be done better? Um, Well, there's a huge agenda ahead, I think. It's a combination of... In in, in, in 30 seconds, please. (laughs) Right. Well, okay, I think you to move forward, right? And that's, I mean, I think the good thing right now is that the concept of systems thinking is is really well accepted or relatively well accepted, I think, which means that you have to think, you cannot just uh, go out and start basically getting better, some kind of commodities, and then just hope this will take care of itself. I mean, technology has to be accompanied by policy and vice versa, okay? They have to go together. And so research on how they can reinforce each other and particularly also a value chain perspective and basically linking, see the demand drive as a, as the heart of the solution rather than just a, a side issue where you may, may also have to look at. I think all these things are crucial in designing the research agenda for the future. That's in 30 seconds. <laughs> Great. Thank, thank you, Johan. And of course, we know there's a tremendous amount of rethinking going on in the CGIR system at the moment about how to exactly respond to that to that sort of change. Um, I'm watching watching time here, so we need to really move on to the implications of all of this. And, and you know, we've heard a lot of the challenges. We've heard some of the opportunities, the sort of directions that uh, one needs to be going to put these pathways into, into practice. So coming to the to the nitty gritty part of this this discussion, what does this actually mean for the way donors should be investing their resources, how they can play the most catalytic role, coming back to what uh, Marie said at the beginning, that of course donor funding is relatively small compared to what private sector is investing or governments are in, investing or farmers themselves are investing. So Carla, with, with that in, in mind, perhaps I can come to you first and, and hear a little bit from you about what's the current thinking in the EU about the best way to use your resources to catalyze change. Many, many thanks, many thanks, Jim. And uh, very good. Let me say that uh, you mentioned that we have in this new phase of the new portfolio for 2021-2027. Clearly, with the Green Deal as a key policy, let me say that the Green Deal in some way will guide our European external action. So in many, many countries, we will take really a more holistic food system approach, food production, biodiversity, forest, climate, pushing dialogue and analysis 
with government on one side, but also with the private sector and the civil society in the other side. And uh, working and supporting the countries through, let me say, four interrelated the key pillars of action. Governance, capacity building, investment that we, 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 we just mentioned, innovation and, and the research. On what clearly through this uh, uh, multi-sector approach. A priority will be, of course, the de development of a sustainable value chain. I think uh, Amadi has already mentioned how could be important. I could use also the cacao as a good example in which we are discussing with Ghana, Ivory Coast, very soon with Cameroon, in, promo in pushing private sector, governments, and NGOs uh, to improve incomes, livelihood of farmers, halting deforestation, eliminating child labor. So around the example of cacao, we can create really a, an interrelated intervention multi-sector. Multi One other area will be, of course, need an investment on people, just to mention the role of women, it will be very, very important also for us to support rural women, women farmers. Uh, we will have a strong target on, on women. And the third element will be, once again, the priority to innovation and research will be a key point also in our future intervention. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. And, and having heard that, how many could I come to you. And of course, you have tremendous experience in seeing where donor resources and programming funding can be helpful or, you know, maybe sometimes less helpful in the African context. So, you know, what would, what would be a few of your key messages to the donor community about what is going to be the, the most useful and the most catalytic role that can be played with these sort of resources as we look to this transformation agenda over the coming five to 10 years? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Jim. I think this is a very important question and I uh, uh, and appreciated you asking, uh, asking me to, 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 to jump onto it. Um, in, in looking at uh, how the food system or the food, se uh, the food sector has evolved uh, over the last uh, two decades in the continent, uh, one can notice that we went uh, uh, to, to an era where we had, a, uh, um, we were self-sufficient in terms of what we were producing uh, to now being dependent on, uh, on food import. So the African continent uh, spend uh, roughly between 30 to $50 billion a year in terms of importing uh, their food. It is uh, one of the few continents where we produce what we don't eat, we import what we, <laughs> we need, and we, we support basically uh, uh, other basically uh, food system in other continent. Uh, for for us to need to meet basically our um, uh, our need in terms of food uh, food security, we need to start growing what we we eat. So we need to start investing into some strategic value chain that will help the continent to meet its need in terms of food security. Uh, yes, cacao is a is a very good. Uh, uh, good example, but it's uh, completely something that is destined to, to export. Uh, I remember uh, a couple of years ago, I was uh, attending a meeting in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Rwanda, uh, where President Kagame uh, shared with us a, a very interesting story. He said he met with the Minister of uh, Agriculture of Cote d'Ivoire, and he told him, look, you're producing cacao, you're selling it to Germany, and you're importing chocolate. Uh, why don't we just pull our resources together and produce the chocolate in, in, in the continent and sell it to the continent uh, and, and make that, uh, uh, that extra uh, value addition? The problem in the continent is that we don't focus on the strategic value chain that, that need to feed our people. You have the maize that is a very big crop in the southern Africa. Uh, you have rice that is a big staple that is import, mostly imported. Uh, you have cassava that is a uh, that is a very strong uh, crop also that people are are depending on, but where we don't do enough research so that we can produce it, uh, and 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 I can go on and on and on and on uh, on the different uh, value chains. 
So, 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 so how, how many in, in, in that context, where do you think donor investments can be most useful and most catalytic? To me, I think uh, donors investment could, could, be, uh, could be targeted in two, two or three areas. One, to support the creation of an enabling environment for, uh, to incentivize people to, to invest into the rural areas. Uh, that would be like a game changer. You have like a 60%, uh, almost 60 to 70% of smallholder holder farmers who, who live in the rural areas. They are not connected to the market. They don't have feeder roads. They don't have infrastructure. They don't have uh, access to inputs. So if you create the incentive for the private sector to move into, those, uh, into that, that, that space, that may be a, a very big boost in terms of changing, uh, to, to, to changing basically the, 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 the narrative. The second area where you can, uh, you can, uh, you can support uh, the continent is uh, by helping the continent to create like uh, standards so that product also can move freely across borders. Uh, you cannot, pro if you want to sell your, uh, your cassava that is produced in Cote d'Ivoire to, to, to Ghana, you need also to, to, to make sure that the standards speak to each other. Uh, mm -hmm. not just the, to the international standards. So that's another area that I think may be a, a game changer. The third area uh, is really to capacitate, uh, uh, to capacitate smallholder farmers with knowledge. We used to have a lot of extension services in the 70s, in the 80s, and somehow they are all disappearing. So the private sector, because many people think that this is a, a public sector engagement. Uh, I remember a few years ago uh, through our program at NEPAD, we, we provided fertilizers to a group of, of women uh, and we thought, okay, we were helping them. And then they burn all their crop because we didn't provide them with, a, with, with the training that they needed to. Those are little things that you can invest in, but that may have huge, huge impact in the continent in terms of uh, addressing the issue of food security and also helping the smallholder farmers to be capacitated to integrate the, the value chains. Okay. Great, thank, thank you, Hamidi. Really, really interesting points there. And I think that also speaks to the link back to the private sector. And in a moment, I'll come back to Hanika to get your view on where you think global public funding can be helpful in helping to catalyze uh, change in the private sector. But before I do that, Martin, can I come to you? I mean, you've, you've got uh, you know, a whole career of experience in looking at uh, what's going on in investing in these, these spaces. What, what's the global donor community got right over the last 20 or 30 years? What have they not got right? And what do you think some of the implications of that are for, for the future? Um, well, you know, I, I don't know whether we should have single out the donor community, um, but if you look at the state of the global food system, you know, and, uh, and the kind of, you know, if you look at the hidden costs of the global food system, uh, clearly right now, um, the global food system actually is subtracting value. You know, if you kind of factor in those uh, those hidden costs rather than adding value, and I think all of us working on agriculture, including donors, I mean, bear some responsibility uh, for that. Um, you know, I, I think where donor financing can be most catalytic is actually to kind of embed, I mean, uh, donor support into government programs themselves. I mean, rather than a separate standalone uh, projects, uh, because doing so would then enable uh, shifting and repurposing public support also behind the agenda of food systems transformation. So the donors also can get actually leverage. Um, and of course, uh, by doing so, um, uh, rather than having standalone project, uh, you know, and, and, and putting your support behind a sector wide approach, I mean, that will also provide a platform for donors actually to work more effectively together. So you also get better synergy between the donor support, I mean, to a particular country. Uh, so that would be my advice. I mean, go for sector-wide approaches where donor support is embedded in government programs, uh, generating needed um, um, investments, uh, but also accompanied with um, uh, policy reforms to get the, uh, the incentives right. Great, thank you. Thank you, Martin. And that's from the government policy side. Hanneke, I mean, how, how can you see global investments helping to catalyze change on the private sector side? Where would you like to see money invested? Yeah, I think donor financing can really help de-risk private sector investments. Um, and that's most helpful. So that can be done by taking on a first loss role or even sometimes investing in critical infrastructure as needed so that the business case is gonna work. It's uh, what Dr. Ahadi also referred to. 
So governments have often done this, which has been great, but we've seen NGOs and foundation donors increasingly supporting this approach as well. So I think that is very, very helpful. And again, I, uh, I've mentioned the IDH farm fit fund as a, as a really great example of that. Great, great, thank you. And, and uh, do you have some other examples of, of what this de-risking looks like? Well, de so de-risking um, really, it's, you know, uh, let me just use, uh, if I use Firm Fit as the example, you know, it's a 100 million euro public private initiative was launched last year um, to catalyze private finance to enable millions of small holders to improve yields um, through access to affordable finance and services. So they co invest equity and junior loans. Um, and then provide services and credit to these small homes. So, and the blended finance de-risking facility is managed by IDH, Unilever, Jacobs, Dow, Echbers, Mondelez, Ravel Bank funded with an additional private lender and a match from the Dutch government alongside USA. So it's really, really public private. And I think it works. So it's complicated, which is, you know, where, well, why it's so important that we all collaborate, we all know each other, we know how to find each other. Um, but then you get something that works at scale. So uh, I hope we can have more of these around the world. And again, as I said before, I think the uh, World Economic Forum's innovation hubs are trying to work in similar ways. Right, thank you. Thank you, Hanika. Yo, and Swinon, let me, let me come back to you. I've of course, got to give you a chance to talk about how uh, global funding could perhaps be used to support research. But before you come to that, could you perhaps give us a few, few reflections on what we heard from Martijn, which if I understand incorrectly, was essentially to say that we're not pricing in the externalities of how our food system operates, which you know maybe suggests a pretty fundamental shift or our economic thinking. Now, to what extent can we bring about this change without tackling some of those externalities and how might we deal with those? And is there a role for uh, donor funding in supporting thinking on that? Um, well, that's a very big question. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like giving you big questions with a short time to answer them because you do such a good job of it. Yeah, well, I think the, um, on the, yeah, the hidden costs essentially relate mostly to health costs because of the unhealthy diets and the environmental externalities, right, what we talked about. I think um, to one thing, for example, to make it very concrete, okay, what we're working on together with the World Bank and OECD as well, is to look, for example, on the, the vast amount of uh, agricultural subsidies which are given by many countries in the world. So how, how are these affecting the, uh, the externalities? And so I think that's a very practical uh, project. It's, it turns out that it's actually more complicated than one would think. Initially, most of this analysis was done, okay, how is these agriculture subsidy programs distorting global markets and can we reform them to minimize the impact on global the distortionary effects? And so this is a step further where we basically try to see how they're affecting these, uh, the, yeah, the hidden costs or the negative externalities. I think that's a clear place where research is really important to identify that and to feed into the policy project. Policy process, sorry, thanks. All right, thank you. And, and let me just give you another chance before I come to, to Johan. Um, what, what do you see as being critical areas for uh, global donor investment in, in research moving forward? You have a two or three sort of top, top areas that you'd say these are the, the most critical? In terms of research, well, at this point, you already referred to it. So the CGIR system is undergoing a massive reform and so there's big rethinking of uh, government of basically a donor investment in that. And I think this is really a crucial moment to step in there for governments to identify their priorities and, uh, and basically co-create these new investment plans, I think, going forward on agriculture and food research. On the other hand, I think we have the, the issue of infrastructure, okay, is, I mean, this is less research issue, but our new research shows essentially that, you know, the, the, the adoption of new technologies in, in a variety of ways is highly correlated with distance to, and distance in time to the cities, okay, and in the, in the, so anything which is reducing this uh, distance between the smallholders farm and the city has a massive spillover effect on the technologies that are used in their profits, the intensity of farming, and ultimately the incomes as well. And I think so there's lots of room, I think, for better investments. 
Great. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Johan. Uh, Johan, some, some thoughts from you on uh, where global funding from the donor community should be going. Thanks a lot, Jim. Well, a lot have already been said, so I'll keep it short, but clearly for us, I mean, alignment with partner countries' strategies, partner countries' policies uh, is really uh, a key aspect in order to be efficient, support the strengthening of uh, partner countries' institutions, uh, notably local authorities, which generally uh, lack expertise uh, and funds to fully implement territorial policies is, is a key aspect. For us, it's really critical to ensure the sustainability uh, of our investments results. And the rest, of course, donor coordination is absolutely uh, indispensable, especially in a time of the COVID-19 crisis, which is such a magnitude. So it's a, it's obviously a, a key aspect that has already been identified by other panelists. Um, synergies, I think Johan mentioned that before, or Martin, perhaps, sorry, um, the importance to, to, uh, to explore and strengthen synergies as much as possible. It's also the case when we think of dealing with agricultural and rural investments on one hand, we should also strive to reach climate and biodiversity uh, co-benefits. So clearly an important thing for us. I totally share uh, what uh, what Carl has said about innovation and research. And in that regard, I mean, there is a, a very important uh, initiative, uh, DESIRA, uh, Hel uh, a European initiative, which for us is, is really reflecting on this. And, um, and also what Hamadi said about the need to strengthen capacity and to train uh, uh, rural uh, agriculture. So really, um, I think a lot has been said already, so I I'll stop it there. Thank you. Lovely, thank you, Johan. And, and, and Carla, um, I mean, maybe coming back to you and picking up on what Johan said earlier, I mean, are, are there areas where you see uh, donor investments being able to have a bigger impact on uh, women's role in agriculture, empowerment, women having a greater role in the, in the value chain and tackling some of the challenges we, we all recognise in, in that area? So I, I, I mentioned this. I mentioned, of course, this this part of supporting in in women in tackling gen, the gender issue, also in this domain of the food security of the the, the food system, uh, but. Maybe if there is the last time that we intervene, I would like to say something that, that was already mentioned, that if the agri-food system challenges are universal, each geographic area and each level have its own specificity. So the tailored approach that was already mentioned, it's very, very capital for us. So there is no one size fit all in, the, in this domain. And this is the reason why we are supporting the FAO and also the research agency in the preparation of food system assessment in each country that they have interested in working with us on this. But this is very, very important because it is a will allow to identify country by country what will have to be the, the priorities in all the different domains that we have mentioned during this panel. Over to you. Lovely. Thank you, Carla. And I, I'm watching time here. We have a few minutes left, so I'll go around the panel and ask for a, a final, very brief wrap-up message in a moment. But before I do that, there's a question here from Courtney Buck, which I'll put to you, Hanneke. I'm not sure if you know the background of this, but are there any lessons from the new Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition Initiative, which also emphasise public-private partnership that we should be learning from? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have enough background, but I'd love to learn any salient lessons. So uh, if there's others in the panel who know about the salient lessons from that, would love to hear it. Any of the other panelists got a response to that one, or will we put that on hold for our Thursday's discussion? Okay, we might well, perhaps we can bring that up on 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 Thursday. So, look, with that, um, we could we could keep going with this discussion for for a lot longer, but we do unfortunately have to wrap it up. So let me just go around the panelists and uh, ask each, each of you for one closing uh, final final thought. Martin, why don't I begin with you? Well, thank you very much, and this has been a, indeed a very great uh, panel. Uh, I think one thought that I um, want to put on the table is that uh, when we talk about food systems transformation, it will only happen if eventually, of course, all 500 million farmers are going to be part of it. Uh, and I think we need to keep that in mind in moving the agenda forward. And I think, you know, a very good outcome um, of the Food Systems Summit would be, you know, a, um, a clear consensus and recognition, I mean, to kind of... Um, you know, to redefine what it means to be a farmer in the 21st century. I mean, not just a producer of food, but also a provider of ecosystems or nature-based solutions and that actually governments, private sector recognize that 
and align the incentives accordingly. Thank, thank you, Martijn. Uh, Johan? Sweden? And next time I'll put Jo in my name. That's easier for the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks, Jim. I mean, we touched on a lot of things, and so it's hard to give, uh, I mean, a kind of wrap. I think the... I think Martin, what I really liked about Martin's uh, intervention was basically the identification of, of hope and challenges at the same time. And I think that's, I mean, the challenges are huge, particularly since the, the numbers are going in the wrong direction, even before COVID was clear. But at the same time that there is hope, there are indications that things could change, et cetera. And so I think we should use the momentum to actually introduce a number of really important changes, both in the private sector world and in the, in the public sector side. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Jan. Uh, Carla? Uh, I would like maybe reiterate once again that, uh, that in fact, the, the transformation will happen only if, if we will be able to demonstrate that the benefits uh, for this transformation are there, the economic, the social, the environmental benefit. And maybe I want just to conclude uh, reassuring Agnes that was with us at the beginning that the European Union is really committed to achieve the ambitious uh, outcome uh, to the UN Food System Summit. We think that this summit is a major global milestone in moving to sustainable food system globally, so ready to engage in all the action tracks uh, of the summit and uh, working with all the different actors in achieving a, a, a really ambitious outcome to the summit. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Hardy. Uh, th thank you, Jim. I think on, uh, on my end, I would like to, to see in terms of moving forward uh, a better coordination, both at the global, regional, and national level. Uh, as I indicated, uh, you have different policies and you have a mix of different things at the country level that create a uh, sometimes confusion for the member state. Uh, uh, so so the, the different countries, at least in the continent. Uh, the second uh, area, I think, uh, in terms of moving, moving forward would be to really strengthen the smallholder farmers participation in the value chains. So identify critical value chain and make sure that the smallholder farmers take advantage of those value chains, that they are not just uh, reduced to producing, but not uh, being into the other segment of uh, moving the the produ production from the farm to, to, to the market. Uh, the third area I think uh, that would be interesting is that uh, since we are rethinking the food system, uh, come also with uh, innovative policies that will help basically to create the enabling environment for all actors at least to, to play their role. And the last one is like the issue of uh, financing. So we talked a lot, I, I gave two examples that were extreme where you have one uh, that is a uh, government driven and the other one was a private sector driven, but how we can find the middle ground where we can have uh, uh, basically the right PPPs. So I think these are the four messages I would like to, to leave you with. Thank, thank you, Hamadi. And the, the, the PPP uh, is an opening door for you, uh, Hanika. <laughs> That's right. Well, I, I was going to end on, you know, just a critical importance of dialogue, which, which Agnes mentioned up front. If we're going to get results, we have got to Keep talking to one each other uh, and then move to action. So um, with that in mind, I'd also like to um, encourage all of us to keep dialoguing. We have another great opportunity actually this month um, when we're co-organizing um, with the University of Bahrain and 15 other um, NGOs and, and food private sector organizations, a, a pre-event for the summit. It's all about generating more ideas of what we could do and, and input for Agnes and her team. So that should be exciting, November 23, 24. If I just put in a plug for that, we just got to keep talking. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Hanika. Uh, Yawan. Thank you, Jim, and, and congratulations for this wonderfully moderated uh, panel. Uh, I think your, your management of time is really impressive. My final word will be about coherence and consistency. Um, namely, uh, the need to, to be consistent between the transition uh, that we are pursuing uh, towards sustainable food system in the partner countries and the need to also uh, transform uh, food systems in the developed countries. I think those needs to go together. Um, policy consistency is absolutely crucial. And if we want, uh, it will only make sense uh, to transfer food system in partner countries if uh, at, in, in developed countries at the same time, on the other hand, we stop consuming products 
whose production, for instance, uh, contributes directly to deforestation. So really coherence between those two actions are for, for, for us is, uh, is capital. Thank you. Lovely. Look, uh, thank you all so much. I mean, that was an incredibly rich discussion with a huge range of ideas. I think it's clear to all of us that we're only just scratching the surface of of uh, these challenges and issues, but also the tremendous opportunities that also lie there. And I guess that's the whole reason why the Food System Summit is so important and why all the preparatory work that's going on beforehand from a whole range of different organisations is, is also critical, including the work that the Global Donor Platform is planning to do in getting some of its thinking together in a, in a competition to the summit. So again, thank you all so much. We will be feeding our discussion from this afternoon into tomorrow's uh, global donor session, which will be far more interactive with uh, participants. We will take some of the messages into the session on data on Wednesday and the session on private sector on, on Thursday. And we'll be pulling all of this together into a report from the global donor platform uh, during next year and, and before the summit. So I think with that, again, thank you for, for helping me in this virtual world. I'm very sorry we can't all go and have a, a drink together and, and chat in a more informal way, but uh, hopefully that will happen at some time in the future. And with that, let me hand it back to uh, Paul van der Locht to uh, give a, a quick wrap up and, and close the session. Thank you all very much. And thank you very much to our audience. Jill, I don't, I don't want to ruin your good timekeeping. So we're five minutes late. So uh, I'm just going to uh, echo your conclusion that uh, there's a richness of ideas and initiatives out there. And I think the, the challenge is to get them together in, in some sort of framework that we all agree on and that match uh, local, uh, uh, local needs and, and, and policies. And whether that's a sectoral policy or whether it fits exactly the action tracks that have been defined uh, by the Food System Summit Secretariat, we'll see. Uh, but it will, I think what I take from the discussion is still needs a lot of work to sort of make sure that we keep moving and keep doing things and, and move closer together in, like Hanukkah said, keep talking and keep dialoguing to keep moving together into something that we say, like, yes, this is it. This is what we all agree on, what needs to happen. And where projects, policies uh, and uh, international uh, interventions uh, meet and, and all lead to a better outcome of food systems. So thank you very much for joining and uh, I hope to see you in other sessions. Jim, thank you very much for, for a job well done moderating and hope to see you again later this week.